few days ago, my wife and I uh, came back to church from doing something outside. And uh, I was surprised because when I got uh, to the back portion of the church going to our house, I heard the radio blaring loudly. And it's actually a news report. And although I didn't get to uh, figure out at first what the news was, but I sensed that something, you know, serious just happened. And so I asked one of the custodians of our church who was actually listen, listening to it, I said, what happened? What's the news all about? Why this blaring sound from the radio? He said, Pastor Rich, earthquake. There was an earthquake. I said, earthquake? When? He said, just a while ago. I said, what time? He said, 9.50. And so I was wondering, 9.50? Why, why is it that I didn't feel anything? He said it's 4.6 or uh, 4.7 on the Richter scale. It was strong. In fact, he said we were jolted. In fact, the people in our administration office all came out because they were afraid. You know, the windows were moving, making strange sounds, and, uh, you know, it just shook the church building. And so I was thinking, where was I? Why was it that I didn't feel it at around 9.50? It turned out that during the time, my wife and I were actually on the highway. I was driving the car, and I was on the highway. And that's why I didn't feel anything. Later in the day, you know what happened, right? Past lunchtime, there was an aftershock. Again, people were afraid. And in the evening... While we were having our sports ministry orientation, at the time, I felt the tremor. Okay? All of a sudden, you know, the, the glass, the glass uh, windows were moving again, making sounds. And we said, wow. <laughs> we were silent. He said, did you hear that? Did you notice it? Did you feel it? I said, yes, yes. And my wife texted me, did you feel it? I said, yes. It was an earthquake again. Many people, as a result, are kind of jittery these days. People are afraid. And if you check the Facebook, you will see many posts that have been passed around by people, some of you, <laughs> or your friends, passing out these uh, news from a fee box that says, you know, there's a big one, a magnitude 8 earthquake that's going to happen here in the Philippines maybe in Metro Manila, in some parts of the Philippines. And so people are starting to get afraid. Actually, this is not an isolated case, right? We are seeing disasters upon disasters happening not only in our country, but even in other parts of the world. Disasters that used not to be there, right? For example, on December 26, 2004, Asia experienced an unparalleled tsunami, the worst natural disaster in recorded human history. Boy, this was big news during this time, 2004. And it wrecked havoc, specifically in the country of Indonesia. Do you still remember how many people died during the time? In this tsunami, the worst natural disaster in recorded human history? According to statistics, over 200,000 people died on that day. I still remember watching the news and I was saying, Oh Lord, this is December, Christmas time. Why did you allow this to happen? For sure, thousands of people, thousands of families have been affected, the grieving, mourning over the loss of these people. Just imagine the number, this number, over 200,000 people is larger than the population of many individual cities, not only here in the Philippines, but even in other parts of the world, right? Over 200,000 people dead because of just one tsunami. On October 8, 2005, a 7.6 magnitude earthquake rattled Pakistan killing about 75,000 and enduring several more thousands. Imagine, these are big numbers. 
75,000 people. On November 8, 2013, Typhoon Yolanda, or internationally known as Typhoon Haiyan, hit the Philippines, leaving around 6,000 to 7,000 people dead. And I tell you, these are just some of the many disasters or calamities happening everywhere. In fact, not only in other parts of the world, but right here in our country. I still remember many years ago, I came to the Philippines in, uh, I mean, rather in, in Davao in uh, 2006. I'm already 11 years in Davao. And uh, during the time, I was so surprised because at the time, I couldn't imagine that there's such a city or a part of the Philippines that doesn't get any typhoon. You see, I come from the Visayas, was born and raised in Bacolod City. We get so many typhoons there. I also live in Manila for many years. We also get so many typhoons here, there. But, so when I got here to Davao, I was just surprised. Is there such a thing as a city that doesn't get typhoon in the Philippines? Yes, there is, they say. Davao. And so I was so, you know, proud about it. Every time I go back to my home city in Bacolod or go to Manila, I would just tell people, you know what? Our city is not a typhoon belt. No, you know, typhoon whatsoever. While you are having this typhoon, are you, you are afraid of this, uh, that typhoon, guess what? In Davao, it's always okay. The weather is okay. The most that we get is strong rains. And that's it. Every evening it rains. I told them. And so they were wide-eyed. <laughs> they, they cannot believe that there's a, such a city as, as that. But guess what? That was 11 years ago. <laughs> In recent years, some, something strange is happening in the Vow City, right? Now you will hear howling winds, right? Rain, strong rain, flooding makes you afraid. In fact, last year, I think, you know, we're already getting signal number one here in Davao. Can you imagine that? What's happening in the world? Something's happening. And we are feeling it. We are seeing it. And that's why many people are asking nowadays, is the world coming to an end soon? What do these things mean? Before, when we get a signal number three typhoon, wow, we're so afraid already. Now, what do we get? Signal number four. And we call them super typhoons. And so we're wondering, is the world coming to an end soon? Actually, when the Lord Jesus Christ was still here on earth with his disciples, his disciples themselves were wondering when the world's end would be. Look at me in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 to 8. One time Jesus was with his disciples, and as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ or the Messiah or the Savior, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Jesus said, these are just general signs of the age. You see? it will mark the entire course of what we call the last days. In the Bible, if you see the term the last days, it's actually referring to the period between the first coming of Jesus Christ and His second coming. Are you following me? Many times when you read the Bible, we see the term the last days. We right away think of, oh, the last days, or tribulation period, so on and so forth. No, that's not the last days. The last days is actually a long period of time. The Specifically, the period between the first coming of Jesus Christ and the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the last days. And I tell you, it's been around 2,000 years since we're having these last days. And Jesus says, you know, all the earthquakes and other things, wars, rumors of wars, calamities, so on and so forth, don't be alarmed. 
Why? Because there are just general signs which naturally will mark the entire course of the last days, the period between the first coming of Jesus Christ and the second coming. And they are just like the, uh, the birth pains. Okay? They're just like the birth pains. Mothers here know what I'm talking about, right? Before you give birth to your children or your, your baby, you will start to feel the birth pains or birth pangs, right? Sudden. You know, spasm, sudden pain, and it goes away. And then again, it comes back, and it goes away. And the, the day of giving birth uh, draws near. The birth pains becomes more and more frequent and becomes more and more intense, right? That's birth pains. Jesus Christ says in verse 8, all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. That's why he says, don't get alarmed. However, according to many Bible theologians, you know, just like birth pains or birth pangs, these calamities and other things will relentlessly grow in intensity and frequency as we draw near to the end of the age. Things will just become worse and worse. Calamities will become more and more frequent and Stronger and stronger and stronger. But again, Jesus says, this is just the general signs of the entire age. Don't be alarmed. You know why? Because the big one, the real big one, will not happen until the end of the age. And I'm talking about the great tribulation. That's the real big one. The great tribulation. But you see, before we get to the Great Tribulation, there are actually other big events that will happen in the world. Okay, many Bible theologians believe that the next big thing in God's calendar for the world is the rapture. That's what we're waiting for now, the rapture. Maybe you'll ask me, Pastor Rich, what is the rapture? The rapture is the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will come to the clouds of heaven, is coming out of heaven, down, but not going all the way down to earth, he will just come down to heaven and he will issue a command and the souls of believers from heaven who joined him as he came down to the clouds will unite with their dead bodies, even their ashes, and live again in immortality. And then believers at the time, if we are there at the time of the rapture, we will be in a twinkling of an eye transformed as immortals, and then we will join with the resurrected believers and we will meet the Lord Jesus in the air and we will go to heaven. That is the rapture. After that, the next thing that will happen is that we, all of us believers, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus Christ is going to evaluate the deeds that we did here on earth. This is not for the purpose of saying, okay, you can enter heaven, you go to hell. No, because we're already believers. We already have been forgiven by Jesus Christ. We're already saved. But the purpose of this valuation of our deeds is for rewarding purposes. You see, not all the things that we're doing here on earth will have a reward from God. Only those things that glorify His name will be rewarded. So after the rapture will be the judgment seat of Christ. Now, while all of those things are happening up there, guess what? Something is also happening down here. Down here, the Roman Empire will be revived again in the form of a 10-nation confederacy or 10-nation alliance. And eventually, a powerful leader will rise among them and control or rule over this 10-nation confederacy that the Bible calls the Roman Empire, the revived Roman Empire. And not all long after, this powerful leader who is leading the 10-nation uh, revived Roman Empire is going to uh, establish a seven-year covenant with the whole world, including Israel. You see, there's no peace right as we move toward the end of the age you know this world will just become more and more hostile but during this time all of a sudden through the influence of this one powerful leader is going to broker peace with the whole world including israel 
In fact, this you know, guy will also enable the people of Israel to finally put up their temple. You see, for many centuries now, the, the longing of the Jews is for their temple to be established again. But they cannot do that because the Muslims control the Temple Mount. But let me tell you this. During this time, when these powerful rulers will come onto the scene, I don't know what's with him, but because of his influence perhaps, you know, his power, he is going to broker peace with the whole world, including Israel, and he's going to put up this temple. They will help the Jews to put this up, and then there will be peace in a world, unprecedented peace. And so many people think that, wow, this is a good guy. This must be the Messiah. But let me tell you this, only halfway through the seven-year period of, you know, covenant, or meaning just three and a half years through the seven-year covenant, this guy is going to show his true colors. It turns out that he is the Antichrist. And during this time, halfway through uh, this period, he is going to break the covenant that he made just three and a half years before that. And he is going to invade Israel. And he's going to make Jerusalem the capital of the world and proclaim himself the ruler of the entire world. As if that was not, he is going to get into the temple of God in Jerusalem. And he will sit enthroned and he will declare himself God. And he will force people, he will demand uh, from people to worship him. And he will also force all the people of the world during the time to have his mark on their forehead or on their, on their hand, the mark of the beast, 666, in order for them to be able to buy and sell. And he will also persecute Jews and Christians and many people, believers, will be martyred during that time. Now, while the Antichrist rules the world, God will pour out his most intense judgments on earth, unparalleled, unprecedented in history. And this is what I call the real big one, the Great Tribulation. Everybody say the Great Tribulation. Look at me. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 to 22. Jesus describes it here. He says, so when you see the abomination of desolation, by the way, the descriptive term abomination of desolation refers to the Antichrist. It's called the abomination of desolation. It says here, so when you see the abomination of desolation or the Antichrist spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place in the temple, when he's already there, occupying the throne of God, declaring himself to be God, it says here, let the reader understand. Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. It will be unprecedented, unparalleled kind of tribulation. And verse 22, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect or the believers during the time, those days will be cut short. This period is called the Great Tribulation. And I call it the real big one. The mothers of all big ones. Now, during the Great Tribulation, the Lord will pour out His most intense judgments on earth upon the wicked world. In Revelation, these judgments are represented by the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and seven bowls. Who among you have read the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, okay? If you read it through, for sure you have come across these terms, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and seven bowls. These are actually a series of judgments which get progressively more devastating 
an expression of God's punishment, God's wrath upon this very wicked world. Now, let me read to you several passages, specifically two passages in the book of Revelation that will give us all a glimpse of what will happen during the time. You see, around 2,000 years ago, uh, when John the Apostle was still alive, God had given him the privilege of seeing visions of what will happen during the tribulation period and even the events surrounding it. So this is the vision he is reporting to us. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 to 13. It says here, When the Lamb, or Jesus, opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Imagine with me. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. And the first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Now you might ask me, Pastor, what's happening here? Many theologians believe that uh, this is describing volcanoes erupting that could have resulted from the earthquake in verse 5. Look at verse 5. It says, Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. They believe that this is describing volcanoes erupting that could have resulted from the earthquake in verse 5. And the steam and water thrown into the sky may condense into hail or lumps of ice, big lumps of ice, and fall, uh, fall to earth along with the fiery lava. And dust and gases may have mixed with falling water that it looks like blood, and the fiery lava will burn one-third of the earth's forest. From time to time, I get to see news about the wildfires in California. Yeah, California is infamous for that, wildfires. And just uh, a few weeks ago, I saw a picture of that again. But this time, my attention was just, you know, caught. I said, look at this wildfire. I mean, it's burning hundreds of acres. It's not just uh, burning a part of, a small part of mountain, but it's burning ranges. The ranges of mountains in California. And I said, can you imagine that happening here? Now, if you think that's already worse, get this. On this day, during the Great Tribulation period, the fiery lava will burn one-third of the earth's or the world's forest. Let's continue, verse 8. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain, again, continue to imagine with me, something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, what's this? This is probably a, a huge meteor or a huge asteroid surrounded by gases that will ignite as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. Notice the wordings in verse 8. It says, something like a great mountain burning with fire. Probably a huge meteor asteroid surrounded by gases that will ignite as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. And its impact will create a tidal wave 
destroying one third of the world's ships. The third of the sea becoming blood, maybe actual blood or red tide caused by billions of dead microorganisms poisoning the earth as a result of the meteor. Difficult days. Let's continue. Verse 10. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. Can you imagine it? A great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Perhaps this is a comet since it leaves a fiery trail, right? Verse 10 says, A great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. Perhaps this is a comet, since it leaves a fiery trail, and it will disintegrate as it nears the earth, scattering over the globe, and it will poison sources of water like springs. Verse 12, The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. This is very interesting. You know what's happening here? God will reduce the intensity of the heat of the sun by one third. Can you imagine that? The intensity of the heat of the sun will be reduced by one-third, causing the temperature to drop so low, and I tell you, so low is an understatement. <laughs> Just imagine the intensity of the heat of the sun will decrease by one-third, causing the temperature to drop so low, which will result into severe climate changes. Just imagine what will happen. It's like here in the Philippines, in the, in the last... Uh, uh, few months or so, we are experiencing uh, an unusual cold temperature, right? We're not used to this. Many people get sick. And how about this? When God allows the intensity of the heat of the sun to be reduced by one-third, that will happen, the Great Tribulation. Verse 13, then John the Apostle said, I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Let's move to the next passage. Revelation 16, verse 1 to 11. Okay? Again, we will see here a glimpse of what will happen in the real big one, the great tribulation period. It says here, Then I... John heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And so the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. And that second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. You see, the water in the sea during this time will become thick, dark, and coagulated, meaning it will form clots, masses of thick, you know, liquid. It will become coagulated like the blood of a corpse, killing all the living things in the sea. Verse 4. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. Verse 7, And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments what's happening here the fresh water in rivers and springs will also become thick dark and coagulated again becoming clots or forming clots and this is actually adding insult to injury because during this time fresh water will be very scarce being great short supply because of drought 
but even the remaining bodies of water will you know become thick dark and coagulated verse 8 the fourth angel poured out his bow on the sun and it was allowed to scorch people with fire and they were scorched by the fierce heat and they cursed the name of God who had power over uh, these plagues they did not repent and give him glory what will happen here the heat of the sun will greatly intensify this is the opposite of what happened a while ago a while ago the intensity of the heat of the sun will be decreased by one third this time it will be intensified it will not be decreased it will be increased the heat of the sun will greatly intensify scorching people and with no fresh water to drink people will suffer extreme heat and a scorching heat will melt the polar ice caps which some christian scientists estimate would raise the level of the world's oceans by 200 feet submerging major cities did you hear that the water level of the ocean will rise or will increase by 200 feet now how tall is 200 feet if one story of a building is 10 feet around 10 feet then 200 feet is 20 stories high just imagine the ocean level rising by 200 feet what will happen to our cities what will happen to the vow bye bye malls bye bye real estate we will have no place to go except to the mountains that's what will happen now we are afraid oh the polar ice caps you know are melting that's why we have this climate change because of the the global warming and so on and so forth i tell you that's nothing compared to the time when all these things will happen during the great tribulation period this is a real big one the mother of all big ones verse 10 the fifth angel poured out his bow on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness people gnawed or bit their tongues chewed their tongues in anguish and cursed the god of heaven for their pains and sores they did not repent of their deeds can you imagine this after God pouring out his uh, intense judgments upon the world, instead of these people repenting for their sins, no. They don't, have, they don't want to have anything to do with that. Repentance, no way. It's not in their vocabulary. Instead, they continue to curse God for their pain and sores. That's why all these... expressions of God's judgment and wrath is justified it's just because just look at the heart of these people now how should we prepare for all these things we don't know when these things will happen right how do we prepare for the big one whether the big one is just a regular big one say an earthquake or a big disaster here in the Philippines a big typhoon super typhoon at that whether the big one is the tribulation period or the big one is the coming of Jesus Christ how do we prepare for this we have to be prepared right let me share with you four ways of preparing number one repent and believe in Jesus repent and believe in Jesus since Jesus will rapture or save only those who believe in him we must repent and accept him before he comes or before all these things happen now actually there are different views on the timing of the rapture we know that the rapture will happen because it's already described in the Bible that but theologians cannot ag come to one agreement one view there are those theologians who believe that the rapture will happen before the tribulation period before the seven year period that's why they call their view the pre-tribulation view of the rapture others teach that the, uh, the rapture will happen midway 
They say before the Antichrist shows his true colors, we are going to be raptured to save us from the great tribulation because the great tribulation will happen in the second or the last three and a half years of the seven-year period. That's why they call their views, their view, the mid-tribulation, uh, yeah, the mid-tribulation rapture. Still others believe that the rapture will happen after the seven-year tribulation period, the end of seven-year tribulation period. That's why they call it a post-tribulation tribulation view of the rapture. They say we, Jesus Christ will not really bring us straight to heaven, but we are the ones who is going to meet him in the air, just like you know, what the old people in the olden days do when their king comes home from a trip abroad. Before he gets to the kingdom, far away, he will already be met by his servants out there. And then when they meet their king out there, they're going to come together with him back to the kingdom. And so the post-tribulationists are saying that actually rapture is like that. When Jesus Christ comes, before he goes straight to the, to the earth, we, he will stop in the sky and we will all fly, meet him in the air, and then usher him back to earth, which is his. Now, we really don't know. The one thing for sure is rapture will happen. We don't know when, right? That's why it's very important that we repent and believe in Jesus now. Now. Because what if the rapture will happen in a twinkling of an eye before the seven-year tribulation period? So it will just happen, boom, boom. And people will be left behind, those who did not believe in Jesus, right? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, From the time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's imminent. We don't know when it's happening. It can occur at any time. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, Jesus, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Question, have you already made this decision? to repent from your sins and believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He has already paid for your sins on the cross of Calvary. But you have to make a decision. Have you accepted Him? Have you turned away from your sins? Tonight, I, like, I believe the Lord wants to give you this opportunity to make that once and for all decision. So I'd like to request all of you, please bow down your heads. If you want to repent from your sins right now, reconcile with God, give your life to the Lord, receive Him as your Lord and Savior, repeat this prayer after me from your heart to the heart of God. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Father in heaven, forgive me, for I am a sinner. I have sinned against you in many ways. In thought, in words, and in deeds. And I cannot save myself because you want nothing but perfection from us. Sinlessness. That's why, Lord, I admit that I cannot save myself. But thank you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus, to pay for my sins on the cross of Calvary. Father, I now turn away from my sins. Forgive me. And I also make this decision now to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, you are the only Lord and Savior, whom I have right now, by faith, I receive forgiveness and salvation from your hand, as you promised me in your word. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That is the, found, the foundational step to preparing for whatever will happen. Okay? 
repenting for our sins and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. If rapture comes today, wherever you are ready, okay, you will be saved. But let's not stop there. There's still number two and number three and number four. Number two, how do we prepare or do we get ready for the big one? Live a holy life before God. Live a holy life before God. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. It says here, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Are you living a holy life? Specifically for those of you who have already repented from your sins and received Jesus Christ before, are you living a life according to the standard of God in all holiness and godliness. Because the Bible tells us, as we are waiting for the coming of God, awaiting for the end of the age, we should have this kind of life. You see, all these, you know, judgment, the fury of God is coming upon the earth because of the wickedness of man. Now, we who have already repented from our sins and received Jesus Christ, how can we live continually in wickedness? Right? I tell you, if you are living in a sin, you're not ready for the coming. If you are living in sexual immorality, you are not ready. You are living a dishonest life, you are not ready. If you are idolatrous until now, you are not ready. If you are living a materialistic life, you are not ready for the coming. You are not ready. Now, I'm not saying that you'll be able to live a perfect life here on earth. Because this side of life, we will never be able to live a perfect life. We will always have this sinful nature. But you see, it's one thing to fall into sin from time to time. It's another thing to just live in sin. <laughs> really. Live a holy life. It's hard to do that in this very sinful world, but the Holy Spirit is within you. If you will allow Him to empower you, He will empower you. Amen? Live a holy life before God. Anytime He comes, you are so ready. Number three, serve the Lord faithfully. In preparation for His coming or whatever out there, even the preparation for the coming of your death, my death, we should serve the Lord faithfully. You see, we don't know when these things will happen. We don't know when the rapture will happen. It can occur at any time. We don't know when you will die. Right? But you see, if you are a faithful steward of the resources that God has given to you, you are ready to face Him. You see, when we will be raptured, the next thing that will happen is you will all stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. And He's going to evaluate our deeds. Not to say, oh, you are low in deeds, you go to hell. No, no, no. We will no longer be judged. In Jesus Christ, there's no more condemnation because Jesus Christ paid for our sins. But the thing is, even if we're already Christian, it's very possible that here on earth, we will be, you know, fruitless. We will produce little fruit as far as spiritual fruit is concerned. And so at the rapture, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Christ is going to evaluate our deeds And he will not, you will not receive any reward. Okay. 
So serve the Lord faithfully. Now, it pains me to see that many of our members are excelling outside. Intelligent, talented, diligent, you know, getting awards here and there, rising in the corporate ladder, very successful. But when it comes to serving the Lord, they're like grade 1, section 9. In Filipino, grade 1, section 9. Nakaupo pa sa tabi ng basurahan. Aren't we ashamed before God? In the first place, life is not about us. Life is not about our success. Life is not about climbing the corporate ladder. Life is not about having millions of money. Life is about living for God. Whatever resources you are, is given to you, money, time, energy, talents, intelligence, all of those things have been given by God to you so that you will serve Him. Whether at school, at work, in your marriages, in your family, wherever you are, you must make sure that everything that you do will all move toward the goal of fulfilling the purposes of God on earth, saving souls, discipling people, bringing them to God. That's the goal. So it really doesn't matter how much money you will eventually amass or how much or how many accolades you're going to get. If the rapture comes, happens today, you stand before God, what are you going to show to Him? Your money? <laughs> your rewards? Your awards? Your certificates? Listen to this. All of these things that we are doing on earth, the success, you know, the accomplishments, will only matter if they are tied to our serving God. Yes, you have money. But are you using your money to serve God? Yes, you have influence, but are you using your influence to bring people to God? Are you following me? Everything, everything should be funneled to this one goal of fulfilling God's purposes on earth, of glorifying His name. I tell you, if you are not serving the Lord faithfully, you are not ready for death or for the rapture or the coming of Jesus. You are not ready. It says here in Matthew chapter 24, verse 45 to 47, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his Possessions. Do you realize that? When Jesus Christ comes again and He finds you serving Him faithfully, you will receive a reward. So be ready. Serve the Lord faithfully. Last but not the least. Pray to God and not worry. Pray to God and not worry. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, Do not be anxious or do not worry over anything, including the big one, even death, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And a peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our, you know, natural tendency is to worry, worry or be anxious when we see, when we are faced with a threat, right? Just like what's happening now. There's a threat of an earthquake, a big one. Or maybe there's a threat to your uh, health, and so on and so forth. Our natural tendency is to worry. But you see, God says, hey, do not be anxious about anything. He doesn't say, do not be anxious about some things. Do you see that? It says, do not be anxious about anything, meaning do not worry in any way. Instead of worrying, when you notice yourself, you know, worrying about something, 
turn to God in prayer. With prayer and supplication, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Entrust your life to God. Entrust your loved ones to God instead of worrying over them. And the Word of God says, He will flood your heart with peace. He will give you peace, a peace that transcends all understanding and that peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, when you believe and you know that God is sovereign and in control of everything, that will give you peace, right? Nothing will happen that is not allowed by God to happen. What will happen will happen according to the will of God. If the big one will come, I mean the earthquake, it will come. What can you do? It's in the timetable of God. If you die, you die. What can you do? Right? But you see, since we know that God is, in, is sovereign and in full control, then we can rest assured that everything will be fine. Ultimately, right? You know, and that knowledge will bring us peace. And this peace surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus so that we can stop worrying. You see, when a person worries, is merely thinking over and over uh, about a threat. And as a result, is feeling all the more agitated and all the more distressed. No, you're just making matters worse. And let me tell you this, worry actually doesn't change anything. Worrying is not the same as looking for a solution and doing something to solve the problem. Worrying is just worrying. Tossing and turning in bed, you know. Did it get you anywhere? No. That's why you just have to make the decision. I'm not saying that you will not worry. Because worry will just suddenly come and you'll start to worry. You cannot do about that. You know, the worry coming to you. But you can do something about not continuing to worry. So when you start to worry, turn to God. Pray. Do you do that? Pray. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 27, And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? Can you? No. Worry doesn't change anything. You see, there was this uh, French soldier during the World War I who realized this truth. He realized that worry cannot change anything. And so uh, he carried with him this little note on worry. He wrote something on a, a note. I don't know where he got it. And he carried this with him wherever he went, uh, fighting. He was always carrying this note. And he would read it from time to time to remind him about not worrying. Let me share with you the note, the words on the note. The note says, of two things, one is certain. Either you are the front line or you are behind the lines. Right? If you are at the front line, of two things, one is certain. Either you are exposed to danger or you are in a safe place. Right? Right. If you are exposed to danger, of two things, one is certain. Either you are wounded or you are not wounded. If you are wounded, of two things, one is certain. Either you recover or you die. If you recover, there is no need to worry. If you die, you cannot worry. So why worry? Isn't this true? Again, God is a sovereign God. What will happen will happen. If you die, you die. Many people don't like to talk about death. They say, hey, maybe you'll bring death upon yourself if you talk about death. No! God has already appointed it. You will die, you will die. If you will not die, you will not die. That's why he says, 
you know, if you are wounded, it's either you will recover or you die. If you ro recover, you don't have to worry. <laughs> Why worry? You will recover. If you die, you cannot worry. So why worry? This is not just a funny quote. This is real. This is real. This is how we face the threats around us. So instead of worrying, brothers and sisters in the Lord, entrust your life and that of your loved ones to God through prayer. We don't know what will happen next. In the Philippines, in the world, or even in our individual lives. But listen to this. God is in control. Right? We entrust everything to His hands. We settle a relationship with Him. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Live a holy life before God. Serve Him faithfully. So that anytime He comes, you are ready. And then, when worry comes to you, instead of wallowing or dwelling in your worries you pray to god and stop worrying and the peace of god will just flood your hearts and your mind let's pray father in heaven these are uncertain times that we live in but you lord are certain you are sure. You do not change through ages. And because of that, Lord God, we can rest assured that whatever you have promised us, you will fulfill. And we may face all kinds of troubles in this world. You did not promise that you will take us out of them. You did not promise that you will give us a bed of roses to lie on. We are still subject even though we're already your children, we're still subject to, to trials, troubles in life. And yet, Lord, you have promised us that in the midst of trials, you will never leave us nor forsake us. You will empower us. You will be with us. You will enable us to come through. Lord, I pray that you will touch your people who are afraid here, who are worrying here. Perhaps they're worrying about disasters or maybe someone in the family is seriously ill or maybe the person himself is you know sick or maybe business is not doing well but there's a problem in marriage problem in the family lord i pray that you will just embrace them let them feel lord god that they are not alone and even if people have abandoned them, they are not alone. You are with them. And everything is in perfect control in your hands. And if they will just continue to trust and obey you in the end, they will see your beautiful plan fulfilled in their lives. Help them, Lord God, to have peace, security in you, and to just continue to trust and obey you in all circumstances, circumstances that they are in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.